Well, hello and welcome to the podcast. We're very excited and honored to have today a very special featured guest, Miss Lynette Zhang, who uh, needs no mention, but still we're going to go through her bio today. And we're going to be uh, going through some complimentary financial items beyond precious metals, but the other things that they, they are going to be backing, such as foreign currencies, certain cryptos, and certain bonds. Now, before we get started, if you are new to the channel, please do like, subscribe, and share so that others can gain the knowledge you have been afforded. Now, I will read Ms. Lynette Zhang's bio so that you get a full breadth and depth of her background for those who may not be familiar. So Lynette Zhang is the founder and CEO of Zhang Enterprises, LLC. It's a company that primarily focuses on developing community as a sound money system globally. After her experiences in banking and the stock market, Lynette intensely researched historical global currencies and their life cycle since 1987. This led to the uncovering of central bank corruption and the ongoing exposure of the Federal Reserve data and her predictions of the Great Recession following the housing market crash in 2007. Uh, this multi-decade research effort resulted in understanding global economic policies as well as currency life cycles far beyond the norm of financial advisors as well as many economists. After her subsequent work, excuse me, work in uh, long-term trend identification and asset class analysis, the plan became abundantly clear. Lynette quickly started creating a system to assist others in surviving and thriving the inevitable collapse of the US dollar, which will ripple across the global economy. And although Lynette was one of the first to speak about the reset on YouTube, this has been known widely of the world's evil agenda of the economic forms, the Great Reset, which is now being discussed at great length by the entire economic educational ecosystem online. Prior to her current banking, the stock markets, as an economist, Lynette Zhang attended Fairleigh Dickinson University of Arizona, majoring in business finance. She's also been integrally involved with researching financial markets and global economies ever since. With a passion for simplifying complex financial topics into understanding language, Lynette has been a keynote speaker on currencies at many educational levels, including events and conferences throughout the world. She is also a host on the Lynette Zhang YouTube channel, whereby she creates multiple weekly, weekly videos that help expose the hidden truths which underlie complex financial and economic systems so that people can take decisive action and protect their future accordingly. Lynette also believes further strongly in the value of community and relationships in order to build a thriving financial future in the face of global economic challenges that we are all facing. With all that said, Lynette, thank you for being here and welcome to the podcast. Wow, she sounds really interesting. <laughs> <laughs> she does. She really does. So, you might know a thing or two. Yeah, yeah, might have had a few. Uh, had a few. Wrote scenes. that. I'll have to give them a big tip. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Well, Annette, uh, we, we typically are very much aligned with you in the respect of trying to get our audience involved and proactive with critical thinking so that they can make the best decisions for themselves accordingly. So we already have yep. something coming off the bat. So we'll, we won't waste any of your time. We'll go right into the questions. The first one, I think, is probably the foundational one for our show today, which is we see the 10-year Treasury yield uh, bond tanking with countries dumping it over the side like the Boston Tea Party, countries such as Zimbabwe, mm -hmm. Japan, China, and, and many others. So this is a two-part question for you. Number one, how long can the Fed really bail this out and pump it before it crashes? And once it goes, how much longer will the fake dollar last? Here's my magic eight ball. I will ask it. Right. Um, you know, markets can stay irrational a lot longer than people can stay solvent. And, you know, you know, how long can the central bank do it? The central bank can keep things propped up as long as public confidence holds. That's their biggest challenge. And I believe that it was Henry Kissinger who said, it is not what's true that matters. It is what is perceived to be true that matters. And so, you know, our, our country and, and others obviously have this system called perception management. Well, the problem is as long as they could keep inflation at 2%, then we had what the central banks defined as price stability, which actually doesn't mean the same price. Like if I if I said to you, well, John, that's price stability, you would think that the price just stayed stable right across. No, it's the perception of inflation being low enough that you, the consumer, you, the worker, 
You don't make any different choices. That for the central banks is price stability. So when you ask me how long they can keep this going, it really is all about consumer confidence. And we've reached recently, the current report was talking about how consumer sentiment has gone negative and their uh, and inflation expectations are up. So that's a big, huge problem for the central banks. Uh, I don't think very much longer because I'm looking at the monetary velocity charts from the Federal Reserve Education Department, from the FRED. It's one of my favorite websites. I know you've been following me for a long time. You see a lot of those FRED charts in my work because that's the coming from the horse's mouth or maybe the fox's mouth or the weasel's mouth, something like that, yeah. you know, but they have admitted that there's only three cents worth of purchasing power left in the dollar. And you mentioned, you know, that I've been studying currencies and yeah, there's lots and lots. There's over 4,800 currencies that have gone the way of the dodo bird because governments want to tax and spend and those that control everything. So the one percenters want the wealth transferred their way. And so inflation is the key tool that they use. And as long as they can control it, like, like we were talking about, people don't ask for increases in wages or not much increases. They continue with the standard life cycle. The problem is, is that all this money printing that they've been doing since 2008 is in the system creating this sticky inflation. And so we're at the very end of this life, life cycle. And while I cannot tell you that it's going to happen a Tuesday morning at 835, just like I couldn't tell you in 2008 that Lehman was going to go out on that day, I absolutely 100% knew that the system had died back in 2008. And that's why I started talking about the reset because Christine Lagarde came on a Bloomberg, which is not there anymore, but did a Bloomberg interview. And in this 20 minute interview, she used the term reset about 28 or 30 times. And I went, well, there you are hiding in plain sight. That's what they have to do. This The system is done. So, you know, when, I don't know, soon. That's why, a key focus of mine is now on helping people develop community on a local basis because there are things that we need. Yes, you gold and silver is the foundation. It's sound money as opposed to this stuff that only has any value as long as you give it value, right? But that is deteriorating rapidly. And once that confidence in the system is gone, we're in hyperinflationary mode. It gives them an opportunity to reset us into a new system. So locally, we need to come together because what do you need to have a stable standard of living? Food, water, energy, security, barterability, wealth preservation, community and shelter. I started my urban farm and I'm not a gardener. That that was never the direction that I went in. You know, I'm not a gardener. I'm not a farmer. That's not what I'm about. But um, I started my urban farm. I'm in dead central Phoenix. Uh, I was living in a little two bedroom condo getting ready to retire when this happened. And I went, <laughs> no retirement for me. Um, so I bought this property, just a half an acre in central Phoenix, and I became an urban farmer with lots and lots and lots of trial and error. But you can look around the world and you can see what's happening to the food system and how many people are hungry. So your foundation has to be in sound money because this stuff is going away. But you also need all those other elements. And in order to accomplish that, you have to come together in local community because during hyperinflation, things get real local for a while, right? Mm -hmm. So get to know your grower who grows your food. Go to go to, to, um, to um, 
farmers markets, go to community gardens, go to meetup groups, create your local communities so that you together can provide all of those. I've been working on this forever. I'm more ready for a collapse than frankly anybody I know or almost anybody I know. And yet I'm still not as ready as I want to be. So how in the world starting now can you make that happen? You have to go to people that already have those, those assets, bring what you have, which could be just your skills, you know, wh whatever it is that you have, anything physical, any talent that you have is barterable and come together so that you can weather this storm and feed your family and provide your water and, and all of those. And there's, there's strength in numbers, but I want to broaden that because we can sit back and allow these central planners to do what they want, which is CBDCs and full surveillance economy, where they can dictate what you can and cannot do by the push of a button, where actually they don't even have to push the button, it's an algorithm. If you say this, boom, you are cut off, kind of like what we saw in Canada. And so this community message has to go out globally. And I believe so strongly that we can create a peaceful revolution simply by converting this stuff into this stuff, right? And if enough people do that, you know, I believe that we, especially with what I'm seeing with the rise of the unions and, and even the protests in, in uh, China and different things, coming together in community, we have a voice and we can make a difference. Thousand percent agree with you, and that's one of the things, Lynette, that we work in our community about. Is uh, we also uh, you, synergy and oneness, and 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 understanding the depths of the wealth transfer, like you were saying. Um, one thing we also teach is wherever the enemy comes up with a move, there's always an antidote, right? So there's the, exactly. the the there's the great reset, which is the enemy's plan, but God's plan is the global currency reset through precious metals, like you always say. And that's, you know, again, one of the many reasons we wanted you on, because it's the same axiom that we try to instill to our audience. And also to your, as a footnote to your point, Lynette, uh, uh, you know, as you know, central banks usually have a 40 to 50 year life cycle and we're well overdue. It's funny you mentioned Kissinger because he was really the one that kind of forced Nixon to be the fall guy in 71, taking us off a temporary gold standard and how'd that work out 53 years later we're still working to get rid of it so <laughs> i'm always leery when the government says temporary and whenever you ask somebody what's backing the dollar they can never really tell you what it is the full faith and credit of the u.s is government the full faith and credit of the government right right translate right. that yeah what as does that long mean as you trust them you have faith you will continue to loan them money extend them credit Right. That's what backs any of this stuff. It's just a government's ability to grow more debt and they can do that till they can't. Absolutely. Just a funny story on that before we go on to our next question. Um, I remember three years ago during the pandemic when we were all outside and outdoors doing Christmas or the holidays, um, I gave each of my family members a $50 bill and they all were very incredulous. Like, oh my goodness, thank you so much. Like, what are you thanking me for? I only gave you two cents. Like, what do you mean? It's a $50 bill. Like, no, it, it's a debt instrument. They're like, no, it's not. I'm like, well, tell me what's backing it. And they said that. I was like, right, but what tangible assets are backing it? They couldn't answer that. So that was a nice little social experiment with the family. Um, so next question I wanted to, to kind of, we'll get back onto the path of this, even though it's all sort of conjoined. Um, about a year and a half ago, I joined a bank that I, I heard you talking about, and that really got my antennas up, and, and I was glad you said it, Old Glory Bank in Oklahoma. Mm -hmm. And um, I've thoroughly enjoyed the way that they've treated me with the benefits across the board, especially in a constitutionally based aspect. Um, right. I also heard you make mention of them, uh, like I said, in another podcast. So my question is, how did you find out about them and what do you enjoy about them the most? Well, uh, the way I found out about it is somebody sent me an email and said, would you look into them? And that's, you know, if somebody sends me something and I go, okay, I will look into them. Uh, but I do think that they are a, definitely more of a constitutional bank. And so, you know, the, the banking system right now takes your equity and uses it to gamble with, and you don't even realize it. Whereas that bank does not do that. 
So it's, it's, I mean, th there's certainly a reason to have a banking system. It, I mean, this would be a bad problem to have, you know, good problem to have, but you know, if I wanted a trunk of these things, that's a little challenging to put in my pocket. So there's a place for everything in the system, but having money, uh, having sound money backing things, constitutional money just makes a whole lot of sense. So um, I, I, it, it was a while ago that I did that piece, but yeah, when somebody asks me a good question, I figure if one person has that question, a hundred people have that question. And if I can support a good entity that is really trying to do right in this world, including a bank, not all banks are evil or have evil intent. And so I think that's what I got the most out of that, out of that research. Mm. Yeah, I agree with you. And that's, and, and, you know, I, I like their governance as well with, you know, Dr. Carson and uh, you know, yes. some other people. It's, it's, a, it's, it's built solidly from the ground up. So I agree with you. Exactly. So, and it's about being for the people. Yes. Yes. Yeah, that's exactly. key. Yeah. It's free of politics and all that. It's just about doing what's right. So, yes. Yeah, absolutely right. <clears throat> now, um, this isn't meant to be controversial, but it is something that's a key backbone of our channel. So I had to bring it up with you. Um, I've heard you say what I would consider to be some disparaging remarks in regards to the Dong, Vietnamese Dong, the Zimbabwe bonds, the dinar and other currencies. But the reality is all those currencies are not showing their true rates. Like for example, Iraq is on a program rate on the Forex. Their real rate is on the private sector, which they're working to bring back now. Prime Minister Sudani is working diligently to bring the dinar back onto the international stage. Um, as you may know, they're ranked number fourth in the Middle East in gold and 30th in the world in gold reserves. Not too bad for uh, a, a very powerful country with a lot of reserves, more than people realize. Uh, they also have the world's largest amount of phosphorus, as you probably know, which, which is valuable, obviously, as another uh, resource for people to have. Um, but uh, with all that happening, it, it's, it's going to be, those currencies are going to be backed by the stuff that you always talk about, which obviously we agree so what do you at some point at some point but i think sooner than people realize because they're they're de-dollarizing through bricks mm -hmm. you know they're tired of the u.s hegemony being on their backs on their necks and i think we believe it's our team is going to be a lot sooner than later because like i said they're in process now you also have nelson chamisa who's a a, a christian who's a presidential candidate for zimbabwe their elections are in august and he sounds a lot like president trump in terms of you know, bringing prosperity and removing corruption. And, you know, a lot of these countries tend to copy each other. So um, what is your standpoint on, with that in mind, your standpoint of these countries getting back to an asset-backed prominence? Well, frankly, that happens 100% of the time. So uh, they're not going to do, you know, if they're a government that likes to tax and spend, then that's why they took us off the gold standard to begin with. But ultimately, when the public loses all confidence, and especially, you know, you brought up Zimbabwe, which is one of my personal favorite topics. I've been following that for many years since they've been in hyperinflation. 2006, I think, is when I first started really following what they're doing. And they have, their public has lost all confidence in the currency, in the system. They've had six, they're on their sixth iteration of a new currency, but they're really also very opaque. So they did, well, what was it about a year and a half ago, maybe two years, they brought back a one ounce gold coin so that the public, well, it's only the top public that could afford that one ounce gold coin could preserve their purchasing power. Then presumably their CBDC was backed buy gold. Well, they got great uptake on the one ounce gold coin because you hold it, you own it outright, but not such great uptake on their CBDC that is backed by gold. Why not? Because it's not convertible, right? Mm -hmm. And so the new currency that they came out with last month, April, um, what did they do? They kind of did a, a where it's a basket of currencies like the International Monetary Fund's SDR is a basket of currencies with a, comp uh, the, the SDR doesn't have this component of gold yet, but they have discussed it, but it has a component of gold in it. I actually have the, uh, the um, 
their central bank pulled up because I've been having a heck of a time finding out what those percentages are. However, they have part of their own agencies, their government, now they're forcing it, but their own government agencies weren't willing to accept the new note. So I'm going to tell you that in my personal opinion, until it is convertible, in other words, you can walk in with this and walk out, you can walk in with this and walk out with this. It's not going to mean anything no matter who is in power. And I don't know that the public will trust it until they can actually do it, because that's the only way to hold them accountable. Mm -hmm. That's why they got rid of the gold standard way before Nixon. Back in 33, that's why they took it away from the public, who then could walk into the bank with one of these. This happens to be a gold certificate. I don't know if you can, can see it, but this happens to be a gold certificate. So... You could walk into any bank and walk out with this $10 gold coin. And at one point they were equal. They're not equal anymore. Um, and until it's convertible, it's not going to mean anything. This is a $10 trillion Zimbabwe note. What can I buy with it? Didn't even cost me very much to buy it. So I think a, ma a mistake that a lot of people make in thinking that the old dinar is coming back. But it is, it's historically, that's never happened. And beyond that, logically, because so many people outside of the country have bought those old dinars, thinking that they would come back as money, they'll keep the name, but it's going to be a whole new system. And whoever really, really, really does it first, well, the world is going to flock to that because by that point, they'll know the garbage that this is. True, but it's also some interesting footnotes, Lynette, to add to the cash of what you're saying with respect to Iraq just paid off a whole bunch of debt to the IMF with billions. Uh, Zimbabwe has some of the world's largest gold reserves. China just uh, invested $300 million into the mining reserves to get into Zimbabwe. They wouldn't be doing that unless they had the reserves. Like you said, but who's going to you know blink first, what I'm interpreting between the lines of what you're saying. Mm -hmm. um, so it does seem like these countries are getting pretty serious about going back to, you know, a, some amalgam of, of assets, because again, you know, you got Iraq, Zimbabwe, they have more than one thing, and they, they have the ability to do that, and, uh, and I also, with, you were talking about Zimbabwe, I think it was, like you said, a month ago, they switched it to QR codes under the ZIG, and they're going to bake back the bonds in that, uh, but it's, it is going to be asset backed. And you, you see a lot of the, the countries like, you know, Vietnam, like Iraq, now Zimbabwe, removing the corruption wholesale. I mean, as you probably know, in Vietnam, so. you know, I, well, I, we're seeing the evidence. Of, yeah. Trusting that I am. Right. But but what I'm saying is we're actually seeing the, the manifestation of the evidence of it in, 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 uh, in excuse me, Vietnam. I think it was about a month ago or roughly um, one of their real estate moguls tried to steal 12 and a half, the equivalency of 12 and a half billion dollars from the Vietnamese government was actually put to death. So they really are taking steps front of scenes to remove this corruption. So I'm, I for personally, I'm rather encouraged about what, uh, how these currencies are going to play a role with asset back combinations going forward. But I, I do appreciate your, your feedback on that. Well, yeah, I mean, I, I'm not saying they will go there. They're going to have to go there. Yeah. It's not an easy transition because once they fix and they put that strong component of gold in there, mm -hmm. that creates restrictions. So before they really do that, and you and you made reference to it, so they're working on it, is they have to get rid of the debt. Now, the U.S., what are they going to do? They're going to hyperinflate the debt away, which is really what's going to happen, I believe, in pretty much all currencies. They're going to hyperinflate the debt away, and then everything can start out clean. So they're getting into position as are many of the global central banks. I mean, last couple of years, you've seen global central banks, not in the US or Canada or in the, you know, the advanced economies, but you see a lot of countries that are buying gold hand over fist at the highest levels that they bought since tracking began and going back to 1950. So I agree with you 100%. 
that in, but this is going to come after mass loss of confidence, because why would they do anything as long as they can get away with it? They won't do anything until public confidence is lost because there's more of us than there are of them. Absolutely. I agree. But are we getting to that point, Lynette, where society is losing confidence in the dollar? You look yes, at the, we are. Think of the grocery stores. I mean, it's they, they can prop up, like you said the other day on one of your channels, or I think your main channel, you said the stock market booming means nothing. And I agree because yeah. against yeah, it's, it's meaningless because against the backs of the main street society, everybody has to get food. Like you said, everybody has to get energy and they see that stuff skyrocketing it it flies in the face of whatever this installed quote uh, illegally installed government is telling them it doesn't ring true in 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 the uh the mainstay of everyday life now i'm glad that you uh you gave me a perfect segue so thank you for that my next question because it is a transitory process for these countries to migrate over to assets even though they have them but i be we believe when i say we i mean our team because I, I work with a team of people believe that one of the ways that can be achieved is through my next question, uh, which is to say that I understand that you attended a recent XRP conference, I believe. Mm -hmm. in late April. I did. Yeah. And uh, I saw you there. That was good. And uh, you were with some of the uh, people that we've interviewed, Andy Sheckman and Greg Maynard, you know, and other great stalwarts, um, where you were talking about the migration of XRP. We believe in our team that XRP, along with other certain cryptos, XLM, XDC, what we call affectionately X marking the spot, is going to be one of the ways to abridge some of these countries on the new digital asset backed platform by precious metals at, at some point. Um, so the, the with that being said is, what were your overall impressions of the conference? What were your takeaways? And do you think that XRP in conjunction with other things will help these countries make that transition? That is a really good question. Um, first of all, I would say that the reason why I did the conference to begin with is in order to build community because people that move into hard tangible assets, gold and silver specifically, have a similar kind of mindset to those that are moving into crypto, unless it's about trading, but I'm talking about what you're talking about. Um, Excuse me. Here, here's the thing. They brought Bitcoin out in, January of 2009. Mm -hmm. They brought quantitative easing out in March of 2009. I know that people think that the cryptocurrencies are outside of the system, but they have not, in my opinion, well, they haven't, not in my opinion, 2009, they haven't gone through a real structural crisis yet. Do I think they're going to survive it? Yes. But I do not know which ones will. And XRP could certainly be one of them. Bitcoin, look at how Wall Street has adopted it, could also certainly be one of them. And there is in the Bank for International Settlements, the central bank or central bank, a small area for private cryptocurrencies that is outside of their purview. But it's just a very small area. So do I think that that can help and 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 with them being asset backed? Yes, I do. And I think that cryptocurrencies are here to stay. I just don't think we're at the end iteration of it yet. I think that things are going to shift and change and morph as we go through this hyperinflationary depression to burn everything off and be able to start anew and to finish that wealth transfer mechanism. And um, and quite honestly, I'm not smart enough to exactly tell you which ones are going to survive. So personally, my wealth is going into, I have silver for barterability, so for 10 years, but the lion's share of my wealth is right here in hard assets. And I even like the, the well, these are raw. They're pre-33, they're raw. I think, I think it's quite probable, possible that there will be an, overt confiscation of gold. So I like the collectible area better because I believe it gives me an, an, an extra layer of protection from confiscation because there's gold and then there's gold. Um, so, so while I do, you know, what I got out of it, I mean, honestly, I was blown away. I really didn't think I would have anybody at my breakout. I was not a keynote speaker at this event. I was 
just on a panel with my good friend, Andy Sheckman, and also Jason from Glint, who is amazing and fighting the good fight for states to legalize gold and silver as legal tender again. So I, I intend to, if he'll have me, I intend to join him in that fight. Um, but I just can't tell you which one it's going to be yet. And to think that cryptocurrencies are outside of the system, I think that's probably a bit naive, especially looking at how easy it was for China to shut things down when they want to shut things down. I mean, and look at how, how Wall Street has adopted these cryptocurrencies and turned them into trading products and all of this. This book, this chapter has in cryptocurrencies has not yet finished being written. Once it's finished being written and we see who survives it and we see what that looks like, then I will be more of an adopter. I'm I'm not yet an adopter because it's not been tested. Okay, fair enough. Thank you for that. Um, it's interesting. I mean, I have to be honest with you. No, that's that's fine. I mean, that's that's what we're here for. Right. Uh, you know, it's interesting too, Lynette, to note that um, the timing of this is interesting that you went to the conference, as you know, because uh, you know XRP is you're just awaiting the decision from Judge Torres for her to bring it down, and we're pretty confident on this side that she's going to rule in favor of XRP because we know that they're a currency and not a security. So I guess the follow-up question would be, um, we're watching for what happens with Gary Gensler from the SEC. Mm -hmm. because, you know, he talks out of both sides of his mouth, like he's against cryptos, but we know he's had a monopoly on it for a while. So when they do lose, do you think uh, Gensler is going to have to step down in shame? And what does that do to the restructuring of the SEC going forward? Wow, that's a really good question, probably way above my pay grade, <laughs> uh, because I don't typically get, I mean, I definitely follow the politics, but um, I don't think anybody in the political system, I mean, frankly, they're there to legalize the theft, even if they make it appear the opposite way. And you just brought up that point. You know, he says that he's against it, but at the same time, he's controlling it and he's got mm -hmm. some and all of mm -hmm. that. So, uh, you know, here, here's what I learned from, I learned many things from my father, but this I learned. He used to say to me all the time, do as I say and not as I do. And I know that makes him sound less than, but he was really, truly the greatest man I've, I've ever known. He was mostly telling me that about driving. But when he would say that to me, I would say, daddy, that doesn't make any sense. So what I learned from that, and that was kind of like, it's interesting, but that was kind of like our banter kind of thing that we did over lots of years. So it really stuck with me. And so what I do when I'm looking at the politicians or the central bankers, I listen to what they say, I read what they say, and then I watch what they do. And when their actions do not support their words, I know they are lying. When their actions support their words, I know they're telling the truth. So just like you bring up Gary Gensler, okay, do his actions support his words? Don't think so. Yeah, it sounds like, thank you for sharing. It sounds like your dad's, uh, was it was very paradoxical, but still held out. It really made me, I mean, that actually made a huge change in my life, big for me, because it wasn't just that but it taught me what integrity is. Mm -hmm. Integrity is living your words, yeah. not situational integrity when it happens to be convenient, which is what a lot of people want to do, but you have to have it. Even in these hard conversations, you have to have that integrity. We don't have to agree. We can respect each other for our opinions. Right. Right. And, and, and integrity is also, as you know, acting when no one's looking, you know, behind you. Exactly. Seat. So, exactly. No, I oh, yeah, that, that, and it, it really was all tied to do what I say and not what I do. Because he used to be, he'd get a new car, he banged into a tree, never looked behind him. We learned real fast, you do not put your bicycle behind my father's car because it will get run over. And if you happen to be behind it when he gets in the car, you better run fast. He actually did accidentally run over my niece once. <laughs> <laughs> Wow, we're, we're learning more than just finances with you today. Heck yeah. 
I like that. It's okay. Thank you. It just kind of squashed, flattened her thigh, but thank God she was okay. But yeah. Yeah, knock on wood. <laughs> um, so just a few more questions for you that kind of again intertwine with everything. Uh, so you, it, I thought it was interesting uh, over the last three weeks to a month, the Philly Fed has been kind of starting to quietly and yet a little bit more loudly say that they are wanting a return for the gold standard. And we haven't audited the Fed, as you know, since 1956. I guess the question on that is how much gold do we really have in America? And when President Trump gets back in, do you see him appointing Judy Shelton to aid in this process? You know, I hope that he does appoint Judy Shelton because I really like her. I think she can make yeah. a real positive difference. Um, I think it's, I don't know how much they have. I don't know that we're ever going to know how much they have because of all of the leasing and, and all of the shenanigans of funny business that they do. Um, but I would love to see Judy Shelton in that, in that chair. Cause I have a lot of respect for her. So fingers crossed on her. I'm, I'm right there with you. And I thought it was interesting that he, he tried to bring her out in his first term. I think it was more of a litmus test for mm -hmm. when he was going to bring her back, you know, and, and now with, with him getting a, a house and Senate, that's actually working for the people for a change. I think we'll have a better shot at it, obviously. Um, also, just a side question. You said you live in Arizona. I've been there several times. I have a couple of friends that live in the Phoenix and uh, uh, Scottsdale area. So um, I'm assuming, I should assume, but have you been to the Grand Canyon? I have been to the Grand Canyon. I have hiked the Grand Canyon from the North Rim to the South Rim. Right. And my so, bug out location looks like the Grand Canyon because it's uh, very, 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 very remote. Okay. Well, very cool. So, you know, when you, if you take a donkey and get to the bottom of that, that basin, there's a lot of protected little caverns there. And uh, I'm sure you're familiar with Bix Weir, but he had talked a lot about plaster gold, and that's really what's hiding behind there, and that presidents have tried to get at it and been, thankfully, unsuccessful. Um, do you think that will be part of the inclusive of the auditing process for America? Well, I don't know. I mean, it is a protected site. Um, and mining doesn't make things prettier. Uh, I, I don't, I don't, I can't really answer that question. I mean, I personally, I hope not because mm -hmm. it isn't really how much gold there is. And I know that Bix, you know, thinks that, that there's lots and lots of gold in there and that could crash the gold price, blah, blah, blah. But what people need to understand is anything that's physical, there's a finite amount. doesn't matter how much it is. There's a finite amount of it. Um, so could they mine it and could they rebuild our coffers? They can, they can probably uh, confiscate the gold that's out there, uh, the bullion gold, and refill their coffers. I mean, we had quite a bit of it. I don't know how much we have, if we have any left at all, but um, I would love it if that was forced. In other words, if a, if a real audit with evidence mm -hmm. was, was forced, not just going in and going, oh, well, see, here's a gold bar. Okay. It's there. You know, I mean, that, that's just garbage, but I would love to see that. And, uh, and is there gold down there? Probably probably is. Is it worth mining? I, I don't know. The Department of the Interior runs a, a, runs a report annually on in-ground gold, which is what that would be considered, in-ground right. gold. So they account for all of the gold that exists, whether it's above ground or still in-ground. Okay. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see how that plays out for sure. Yeah. I, I hope they can just, they can just leave it in-ground. They don't need to pull it out, at least yeah. from they don't need to pull it out. That would be a shame. Yeah, I just, no, I agree. I just think it, it, the public has a right to know that it exists because uh, it, there's so much stuff that's been hidden from the public and uh, it'd be good for transparency at least people to know that it, it, at the very least it, it's there. You know, I think a great place for the public to start is with the Department of Interior Studies. They do it annually and they do it globally. So um, that's probably, if you want to know how much gold is yet in the ground, uh, that's, it's, it's there. I mean, all of this stuff, all of the research and, you know, cause you're doing it as well. Mm -hmm. It's public records. I don't have access to anything that everybody else does not have access to. Right. 
The difference is, is that you go and read it. I go and read it, right? We think about it. We, we connect the dots to what all of this means. But that's why when I, in my work, I always give all the links. I make it easy. You know, I don't want you to have to waste time looking things up when I've already done it. Here's the link. Verify what I'm saying. Don't take my word for anything. Don't take anybody's word for anything. Right. Do your own due diligence. And then, you know, quite honestly, your opinion is as valid as mine is. Now, hopium opinion, mm, no, not so valid. But but a researched opinion, sure, why not? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're leading people down the path so that, like we are, to draw your own conclusions with the, the best exactly. possible. So, yeah, no, that's fine. And good point about, uh, you know, checking with the interior. That's That's good. Thank you for that. Um, you know, and it's interesting because you mentioned uh, that you've been studying currency life cycles, as we discussed since 1987. Mm -hmm. Not mm -hmm. coincidentally, that's the same time as you know in history that China honored England's Chinese rail bond redemption. What if that were to happen again in America? And what about the velocity as it relates to foreign currencies we were talking about? A good example would be the Lebanese pound. As you know, they devalued 90% in 2022, but they're now taking steps like we talked about other currencies to remove corruption. A good example would be Javier Malay in Argentina. Mm -hmm. So with all that said, uh, how do you see that situation possibly playing out? Which situation? I'm sorry. Well, well yeah. Okay, let me, let me rephrase that. Well, with the Chinese bond redemption here in America, again, you know, once Trump and other people come in and implement the gold standard, et cetera, but also, do you see Lebanon kind of rebuilding themselves in the same way that Argentina is now doing under a good direction of Robert Malay? Well, I, I, I hope so. That's, that's what I'm going to say about that. But unfortunately, this is the death knell of the entire fiat money system on a global basis. And my concern for most people is the level of pain and poverty that most are going to have to deal with. So at a governmental level, they can redeem the bonds, they can do different things, but how is that gonna trickle down to the public? Because even with Malay, I mean, the public is still suffering. It's, it's going to get better from there, but that goes back to the community, doesn't it? Right. You know, there, there's all of this garbage is going to have to be burned off. It isn't just that they're going to go flick a switch and now everything is backed by gold and everything is just fine and all debt is forgiven and all of this. This is way too big. We are on the biggest ocean liner in the world. You cannot turn an ocean liner in a thimble of water. Right. So it's being it's being absolutely prepared for the worst. Then you don't need it. It's like my bug out house. Right now, I'm going up there this weekend. Right now, I go up there. I enjoy myself. It's beautiful. It's where I can breathe. Um, it's where I can refill and recharge my batteries. But I'm building a community that can support 40 people. So I put in orchards last year. I have hot houses for growing because that's how many people with a whole bunch of different skill sets that it's going to require. I don't know how long this reset is going to take. I do know that it gets very, very nasty. I don't think it's going to be easy. I don't think Trump coming in and appointing Judy Shelton means that everything is just hunky-dory. Right. I think we're going to have to feel a tremendous amount of pain and we need to be prepared for that so that if I never have to use my bug out location to house 40 people, I still love it. It's still a good place for me to go and recharge my battery. Booty hooty, Rudy Manuti. I don't know why that's a bad thing. It, it's the same thing with holding gold and silver. You know, why, why is that a bad thing? Because I, because I know the truth about this, so I don't want it. Right. What, what good does this stuff do? I've got that. $10 trillion note, what can I buy with it? Absolutely nothing. So, you know, I, I think that, I think people really need to be prepared for a hard landing. They're calling about soft landing, no landing, hard land, blah. It, it, it's all garbage. It's, it's all to misdirect you. Look over here and not over here. 
Yeah, ab absolutely. And, and and I'm not saying that, that President Trump coming in while that itself answers all the problems. I mean, that's why we're being proactive on our side. You are obviously been proactive for quite a while with your community, respectively. Um, I think one of the areas that we we intersect well in studying you is that we teach our our team our side to become your own central bank, like you do. You know, foreign currencies, bonds, cryptos, metals, obviously, food, water, land. You know, preferably you get you know land with a water source on it. Something I'm working on doing in the future in Tennessee. Yep, yep. I own the water rights. And and oh, good. And uh, you know, oh, yeah. these lands will have oil and natural gas as well, which is a bonus. Uh, so that you can be as self-sufficient as possible. What we're trying to do on our side, and I, I'm sure you would agree on your end, is, is be a part of that 1% that knows this, but then try to grow that 1% to mitigate the collateral damage in the society as much as possible. Yes. So that's why we, why we want to explore these options, to your point. Yes, a hundred percent. It's it's why, you know, I, I put in, I, I probably put in, I don't know, 150, 200 trees last spring, food trees. Mm -hmm. to produce apples and cherries and peaches and and all of that i've got walnut trees up there i've got some down here i give a lot of food away nice and i specifically planted the exterior of my property out down in central flipping phoenix so that if somebody is hungry they can walk by and pick a zucchini right and they can feed their families because when people get hungry and hopeless they make choices they would not otherwise make. And I feel that it is an obligation of every single person on the planet to share the gifts that they've been given. And so, you know, I think that's how you grow community. Mm -hmm. And also I feel as if what we're asking people to do is to have a huge paradigm shift and admit that what they have been taught their entire lives is a lie. People don't want to admit that. So we have to have some empathy for that and understand that that's where they're coming from. I, I really never get upset when somebody disagrees with me because I understand where they're coming from. And we have to have the patience and the fortitude to plan to help them as well because we don't need everybody to get it. We just need a very ver verbal, what, maybe three or 5% of the world to get it in order to have a seat at the table, along with the people that are, are in power and political power and in financial power. Let's take our financial power back mm -hmm. to your point, become our own central banks so that we have a seat and a say in this next iteration. Because quite honestly, I don't, I can't say that I trust anybody to speak with my voice, right? right. We need to come together so we're speaking with our voice, our voice. Then we have a seat at the table. Can't, nothing I can add to that is perfectly stated. So last question for today, Lynette, is... Um, you know, we talked a lot about gold let's and, and other commodities, but let's also touch on uh, the other one that I know you like and I, we love is silver, right? Yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, God's money, gold and silver, right? And so, um, you know, there's a finite amount of that because of manufacturing with AI and robotics. And, you know, they're going to, I think that they're, they're going to certainly run our silver, you know, and, and, and bid a very pretty penny for it going forward. Um, but I just wanted to, again, just to round things out, we're also a proponent of junk silver to have for barterability, because obviously you're not going to want to bring a 10 ounce bar to the grocery store because right. ounce would feed your family with food and clothing for a month. So uh, what is your, what are your thoughts on two things? What are your thoughts on silver, particularly for barterability with junk silver, right? And then copper, which is something that we've been recommending to people because that's going to be, we believe, the backstop when silver does eventually run out. If, uh, there was a gentleman who said that they're going to have to mine as much copper in the next 10 to 25 years as they have in the last 10,000. So I just wanted your thoughts on that. Well, for one thing, um, copper is an industrial metal primarily. Silver straddles two worlds. It straddles the monetary world, and it's the second monetary metal, and it also straddles the industrial world. Now, gold also straddles the industrial world, but not as much as silver. 
But in both of these cases, it is critical to understand that both gold and silver are used in every single sector of the global economy. So these are the two assets that, that have the broadest base of functionality and therefore the, the broadest base of buyer and why they've never gone to zero. Speaking specifically though, gold is recoverable, it's indestructible. So we can account for about 98% of all the gold that's ever been mined. Silver, on the other hand, gets used up in manufacturing. So it's actually a diminishing asset at the same time. And that's a big change. That's why gold is the primary currency metal because it's indestructible. We can account for it. And silver is the secondary. Now, I have a lot of junk silver. I have enough. Uh, and there are forms that you can calculate out how much is the true value of gold, how much is the true value of silver and you look at what your current cost of living is, and you look at um, of where that kind of falls, and then the, you're talking about a barterable portfolio. Um, I'm not as concerned about a confiscation with silver, even though they did in 33, but because it gets used up, I am not as concerned about a confiscation of silver by the government. Price manipulation, absolutely, even having... President Lyndon Johnson actually came out and threatened anybody that was going to hoard silver, that, that our government would crash the markets. That is an incredible admission to the public that we will manipulate these markets. However, having said that, because I digress, um, I like silver in in any form, and you've probably seen my junk tray, and this is something that is really important for people to understand, that gold and silver in any form is monetary at its base. Mm. So these are 90% silver. This is 92.5% silver. This is more recognized as money, but when push comes to shove, so is this. Right? right? So however you can accumulate silver, sterling silver, 925 silver, is they're both 92 and a half percent pure. I do love silver. I have a much larger position in gold than I do. Silver, I've got covered for myself and my two daughters for 10 years because I don't think this is gonna be an easy thing to work through. I don't think it's gonna be boop like that. And I do love silver for particularly barterability, though I like these fractional gold coins for property taxes, medical expenses, things like that. Mm -hmm. So the way that we work at Zhang Enterprises when we're building out a sound money portfolio is we start with your goals and what you're trying to accomplish and what you have to work with. And then the portfolio is really built in layers to accommodate those different goals. So it's not just one, it's not just the other, it's a combination of the two and the quantity that you should have of each one is based on how you're going to use it. Does that make sense? Completely, absolutely. It's about diversification is what I'm hearing at the end of the day. Thank you. And and really, if you have Aunt Bessie's sterling flatware, I mean, look at this is all tarnished and, you know, the tines are a little bent. It doesn't matter, yeah. right? It doesn't matter if it's tarnished or bent or broken. I used to be able to pick this up at yard sales for, I mean, literally nothing. Now that's not so easy to do. But right. back in the day before anybody was paying attention, it was super easy to do. Yeah, absolutely right. Quick uh, follow-up question before we end for today, Lena, is obviously neither one of us are financial advisors. I don't think you need to be. But just from a practicality standpoint, if someone has gold or silver or they don't have it and they're getting into it or they have and they're trying to improve their position, um, what kind of ratio would you say that you would recommend for the average person in terms of gold and silver that they should be getting? I don't, I don't recommend a ratio. I okay. recommend establishing your goals and what you're trying to accomplish, right? Mm -hmm. And so I said, 
you know, in, in my silver portfolio, for me, that's about day-to-day -day barterability. I need strawberries. I need a tank of gas in my car. I need something like that. And so you define what that is. And historically, I mean, it's, it's actually super simple to calculate the fundamental value of any asset or instrument. There's, you know, there's some nuances to it, but mm -hmm. let me make this real simple for you because it should never be done on a price uh, point because all you're looking at is Wall Street's manipulation in terms of these. What you want to look at is since this is the primary currency metal, it's the flip side of this, right? And so you have to take a look at how money's created in this world, which is by debt. And there's the latest count that I saw was that they admitted to yeah. was 313 trillion. And there's more to it because there's all the derivatives and bets and all that garbage. But let's just stay with that to make life easy. Then you go to the Department of the Interior and they tell you how much gold exists in the whole world, whether it's in ground or above ground. And you just divide the debt buy all the gold, and that tells you the true value mm -hmm. of an ounce of gold right now. Now, I can't give you many guarantees, but here's one I can give you. At some point, every asset or every instrument goes to its fundamental value, okay? Once you, exactly, well, this stuff, you're absolutely right, it's zero, Right now, the last time I calculated, it's over 40,000 bucks an ounce, which I know sounds outrageous, but that's only because of how much debt has been created. Now, whether or not we will go back originally here, I, you can see how teeny weeny it is. This is a $1 gold coin. See how teeny weeny it is? So these used to be equal. So that's a 20th to one, okay? Will it go back there again? Maybe, maybe not. But what I can tell you is I've done studies on what happens to the relationship between gold and silver through hyperinflationary events. I mean, there's lots of them. It's an easy thing to study, really. There's lots of data on that. And what I found is that that gap, I think it's at like um, 76 to one right now that gap will start to go more and more narrow. And this could be the start of what we're seeing in these spot silver and gold markets, right? But then once that hyperinflation kicks in because gold is the primary currency metal, it goes away from it again. Having said that, if you think about loaves of bread, back in the day, let's see, do I have a dollar here? Okay, so either a dollar bill, this has my face on, it's not real, but a dollar bill, a silver dollar, or a gold dollar bought 11 loaves of bread, right? They were all equal. Today, you can still get 11 loaves of bread with a silver dollar. So it held its purchasing power value. You get, I think about, don't hold me to this because I haven't done the math yet, but you get about 300 loaves of bread with this, 250 loaves of bread with this, right? right. That's what happens during hyperinflation too. The, the, that gap, silver gold ratio will go narrow, but then as it heats up, as the inflation heats up, gold runs away because it's the primary currency metal and critical to understand when they do those overnight revaluations, they take this that has absolutely zero intrinsic value and they reset it against this, which is 100% intrinsic value. And it isn't intrinsic because I say it, it's intrinsic intrinsic because it is used in every single sector of the global economy. Yeah. And it stood the test of time, well, you know, for thousands of years to your point. Exactly. And, and that's, that's the challenge at this moment that I have with the cryptocurrencies is that the, it hasn't gone through a test yet. Let it go through a test and we'll see where we stand then. And I'll make some choices. Fair enough. And then saying, how can, uh, people find out about your work and any last thoughts you have for our audience today? Well, uh, the last thoughts would be honestly do it, get it done because the clock is ticking and there isn't anybody that's going to know the exact moment before and then even have the ability to get everything in place. 
So the time to become prepared is while you still can. And they can find our website at lynettezang.com. On YouTube, we're very, very active on YouTube, uh, publishing pretty much constantly. And that is at the Lynette Zhang. Um, and we're also on Twitter, same hashtag, the Lynette Zhang, Instagram and Facebook, at Lynette Zhang. And um, yeah, we just we just opened for business. We just launched our website just like a week or so ago. So so it's it's brand new. But of course, I've been in this industry on some level since 1964. And we do sell both gold and silver, but we're going to have a conversation because we're building a strong community that helps everyone. And oh, by the way, and I know I'm crazy for announcing this, one ounce minimum. So if you want one ounce of silver, you can have one ounce of silver because we're also trying to democratize owning physical metals. Perfect. Well, thanks again, Lynette. It was an honor to have you. We look forward to having you again in the near future and uh, pray to have a, a blessed rest of your day. You too. Thank you so much for having me. Likewise. Take care.